Alicia? I, I, I took these two. You're getting a raise, sister. Okay. Last week, we covered how Omar bin Khattab entered Islam. Okay. And today, we're going to look at the events that occurred afterwards. What happened was that when Omar came into Islam, things changed. You could no longer head on destroy these people. You couldn't destroy them head on. We talked that there are two ways to destroy a people, right? When you're, whenever you're at war, you go head on to someone and you fight them head on, right? The second way is that if you're too weak, what do you do if you're too weak to destroy your enemy? You have to do a war of attrition. Minhaj, aren't you in the Navy? Air Force. You're in the Air Force? And they teach you war theory? You ever hear of a war of attrition? Maybe they have different names for it. You cut the supply lines. You start closing down food supplies, attack the food supplies, attack the oil supplies, attack the communication lines. The Quraysh went on a war of attrition against the Muslims. All right? So how did they do it though? All right? They still, there was some awkwardness in the situation. How do you actually do it? What they did was they said, if we weaken the head, right, then we'll weaken the whole thing. So they had a war of attrition on the Beni Hashem, the Beni Hashem, right, the clan of the Prophet. Why? Hoping to put pressure on Abu Talib, okay, and on the Prophet, peace be upon him, to the point that people would say, the closer we get to the Prophet, peace be upon him, the worse our situation gets. All right? And the, what, this brings about another subject. How is it that one man, the conversion of one man, switched the scenario so much? Well, it's because the whole Sirah takes place in a small city in which the residents of the city may be two to three thousand. That's it. All right? Mecca, the residents, some say up to 10,000, right? If you include the outlying areas. But the main people in the city, it's two to 3,000 people. Sheikh Saeed Ramadan al-Bulti from Syria, he tells us, he gives us a wisdom. Why is it that Allah chose Arabia itself to send this message to? There are a number of wisdoms. But one of the wisdoms is that the Arabs were such a simple people. They were simple people. They could be changed easily. Whereas the Persians were very advanced, very complicated. The Byzantines, which are the Romans, very complicated. Okay? To change the Indians or the Byzantines or the Persians would have taken generations. And there's no time for this. We needed a people simple enough to change really quickly. Usually, when Allah selects a people, right, a person, He selects someone who is down and out. When Allah selects people to do His work, He doesn't choose complicated people. He doesn't choose people at the top. He finds people that are very ready to change because they're already in the gutter, right? Whenever a message of truth comes, it never goes to the top. It goes to the bottom. It goes to people who have been broken by their own misdeeds and are therefore easily changed. Right? And so the people, uh, the Arab, 
were easily changed, all right? And this is why the convert, the whole story, it's, it's just a handful of people, all right? And Omar ibn Khattab's uh, conversion resulted in a, a immediate change in the dynamic between the two, okay? And very quickly, the Bani Hashim, uh, the Quraysh had to move and shift to another type of uh, war, which is the war of attrition. So, who thought of this ban was Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl thought of the ban on the tribe of Bani Hashim. Okay, the tribe of Bani, uh, the clan of Bani Hashim. A tribe consists of clans. Okay, so Bani Hashim then were subject to this ban, and some people call this the original Muslim ban, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, no one could buy from them, sell from them, or marry from them. These are three conditions. You couldn't buy, you couldn't sell, and you couldn't marry. Now, the result of this, all right, it had three unintended consequences. And this is another wisdom and an aside that people have to think about. Okay? Is namely that religion is a very tricky and slippery thing. Such that as it's one of those things that it's like in nature. As soon as someone wants it, it's impossible to stop. As soon as people, whether a people or an individual, wants it, it's impossible to stop, all right? Because when you try to destroy it by putting pressure on it, what do you do? All you do is you weed out the weak and you polish the strong, all right? When you put pressure on believers, guaranteed two things are gonna happen. The numbers will decrease. The weak will go. Those whose faith is weak and who come at a price, they'll go. Right? But those who stick around will become more polished, stronger, shinier, and they'll become better ambassadors for their religion. Right? So that's why pressuring a religion, the believers of a cause, especially a spiritual cause, all you do is make the ambassadors of that religion more polished and more strong. Although you've weakened the numbers. However, Weakening the numbers is not always a bad thing. When you decrease the numbers of a people, you allow for better coordination amongst them. So if you have an umma of a million people, well, who's going to control a million people? How could you bring a million people to work together? But if you then put pressure on these people until that number dwindles down to 500,000, 400,000, 300,000, to 100,000, to let's say 50,000, that means you took off 95%. Well, now we're only how much? 50,000. 50,000 people, you pick 100 leaders. Each one is responsible for 500 people. We can coordinate, right? Loose coordination could happen. We could all be on the same page. Many times Muslims say, well, look at the Jews. Look how the Jews do it. Why are the Jews so coordinated and we're all so sloppy? Well, simple reason. How many Jews are there in the world, right? I don't even think there's a hundred... How many Jews are there in the world? How much? Yeah, that's what some ridiculously small number. 10 to 11 million Jews in the world. It's not that difficult to establish certain habits amongst them, right? Certain... A culture amongst them. 10 million people. How many people are there in New York in the, at night? When everyone's left work. There's like 12 million people in New York at night. 25 million in the day. When people commute for work, 25, 12 million at night. There's more people in New York, right? There, there are more Jews in New York and New Jersey than in Israel, right? Which is their country, okay? So it's easy to coordinate. So actually, when you put the religion under, in a pressure cooker, you eliminate the froth and the waste. Eliminate it. This elimination, when you see people leaving the deen, Okay, and you have pre-apostasy movements. Apostasy means people just leaving the deen. It's happening. But then you have another thing, the establishment of pre-apostasy movements. In other words, one stepping stone away from leaving Islam. 
Now you make so many changes to Islam that if you pass that on to the next generation, what is their motive? You've taken away every motive for them to keep it. Right? Yeah. Is that like when a lot of people uh, want Islam to be just to keep their own limb and that's not their reason? So they just like start to justify it. That's exactly what's happening right, right now. And the result is when those people have kids, right? And you tell them we're Muslim. They say, okay, well, what is Islam? It's like, it's nothing different. Then what is the point of keeping it, right? You've given me no incentive to, to have it. It has no value. If I'm saying I got this bottle of water, right, for $1.99, and then you go make Minhaj water, and you bring me the same bottle, and it's also $1.99, why should I get yours when I already have this, right? So you remove the incentive, right? You move every differentiating factor. You give the next generation no reason to keep it. So the next generation is a guaranteed loss, right? So which, if you look at religious traditions, which religious traditions last the longest? The religious tradition that lasts the longest is that one that makes it very clear where the religion is based out of. So if you say it's based out of this book and nothing else, right? It's very clear. Right? Then it's hard because anything that's not in the book we have to reject. Or whatever contradicts the book we have to reject. So it's hard. Right? Not a lot of people are going to want into it. But it's going to last. But if I say, let's make it this book and whatever else is going on. Anything difficult, just leave it. And anything that you really want, just take it. At that point, those religions die off. In Judaism, right? In, Catholic, in Christianity, the, one, the religions that have a very clear barrier of what the religion is and what the religion isn't, and they don't negotiate on those points, those are the things that last. Orthodox Judaism, Hasidic Judaism lasts, right? Reform Judaism is gone. You'll never find a, a family that says, I'm a Reformed Jew, my dad is a Reformed Jew, my grandfather is a Reformed Jew. You have one reformed Jew, next generation secular Jew. No Jew, not a Jew at all, right? Just by heritage, okay? Christianity is the same thing. Catholic, you can find many people. I'm Catholic, mom's Catholic, grandma's Catholic, great-grandma's Catholic, all Catholic. Why? Because Catholicism is very clear what it is and what it isn't. Whereas the various Protestant churches, like what is Protestant? Anything not Catholic is Protestant. You can start up your own church. You can start up Minhaj International, right? And make yourself the priest or the uh, whatever they call it, right? The minister, whatever it is. You can make your own Protestant church. Anyone can make a Protestant church. So when you go to Protestant churches, you're not going to find father from grandfather from great grandfather from great great grandfather. As soon as you get one in, you've already broken the line, you've broken the boundary. Your next generation is God, right? So, the religion that keeps it, it that is, has very clear lines and non-negotiable, whether people like it or not, whether we get big or small, this is it, this is what it is, that's the religion that lasts a long time, right? It lasts a long time. So, when people always look and say, well, we're small in number, we're not reaching, people have more reach than us. Don't forget, reach always comes at a cost. Your cost is your longevity, right? You're trading reach for longevity, right? So we want a, a religion that fits for everyone. You're for sure trading your longevity. Okay? Like in fighting, there are always two things in fighting. Your reach of your enemy, but your own security. When you study uh, boxing, for example, if you look at my boxing coaches, they look at two things your attack, but also your grounding. So if you're in a good position, right, in order to maintain that spot, that position, even in war, you might have to sacrifice how much you can attack the enemy, how much you can reach others. Because as soon as you go to reach your enemy, what have you given up? You've given up your own footing, your own grounding. Now you're vulnerable. In Batman, the first one, there's a scene where he's training him how to fight, right? So... Batman is, he's not Batman yet, he's just uh, the guy. 
and he's he's being trained by Razal Ghul, which is Arabic actually, right? Head of the monster. So Razal Ghul is finally he's down. Razal Ghul slips. So uh, Batman, who whatever, whatever, what's his name, uh, Bruce Wayne, comes in to give him the killer blow, right? So he stops him. He said, "Hold up, you're coming to give me the killer blow. You don't realize you just sacrificed your footing." And they were they were on ice, so he breaks the ice and he falls into the water, right? So at, you want reach, right? You're gonna sacrifice footing. So you'll get reach, you lose your footing, right? You only get a short-term high. But you keep your footing, you're guaranteed an overall greater reach, but in a different way. You not, might not reach everyone today. But religions that establish on clear boundaries and what the religion is and what it isn't, right? And we all recognize that. If we could be weak, that's fine. We're weak. I'm not doing it well, that's fine. But we do recognize what the religion is and we don't change it, right? What you do is you allow for families to grow inside of it. So you won't have the same reach today, but give it 30 years, right? Your kids are now 30 years old. Everyone else's kids are 30 years old and they're still in it. So the, the religions that have clear, that are clear what they are and what they aren't, all right, they grow slowly through birth, through marriage and children, right? Even more so than converts, right? So if we want to try to appeal to everyone, you're guaranteed you're going to move away from that firm footing of being clear what the deen is and isn't. But if you stay on uh, a clear path, right? What you do is you guarantee family, right? You keep your family, you guarantee, you grow through children, right? And children, uh, any religion, any movement that grows through family is very hard to break, right? Because when your religion is intertwined with the memories of your childhood, it's very hard to give up that religion, right? Very hard. And the look amount of rituals that we have in Islam, right? All of them are extremely memorable. Everyone who grew up Muslim has childhood memories of their first time waking up for suhoor, right? All their tarawih, coming to the masjid, Eid, right? Umrah, Hajj, all right? Every child remembers the first time they saw a lamb being slaughtered, right? All right, in Eid. All these things, okay? All these things. So now I'm a 20-year-old kid, or I'm a, tw I'm a 30 year old guy. Now I have my own kids. What am I going to do? Uh, let's say I'm not a religious guy, but now I have kids. So I say, okay, how did my dad raise me? Right? Most people, at the worst case scenario, worst case scenario, that are Muslim and Sunni or whatever, even in Judaism or other religions, right? If they're wayward, like they didn't have discipline, they don't want to do it, as soon as they have kids, they come right back, right? Allah has a sunnah in this world. If you yourself couldn't bring yourself to the masjid to live on the straight path, your kids will force you to. Because now I got kids, what am I going to do now? I'm not going to deprive them of all those memories. Even a 30 year old guy who doesn't do anything, he still has good memories of Ramadan, right? So he's going to want his kids to have those memories. Then he's going to say, he's going to be stuck. All right, I bought him here, I better pray myself, right? Give it 10 years, the guy's back to being a normal Muslim. This is the wisdom of how Allah uses the family to rectify you, to make you better. Right? Yep. Two of my cousins, uh, they didn't practice Islam as much, but when they had kids, they became super religious. Yeah, you have no choice, right? So you're locked in, and then you realize the wisdom of the whole thing. Some people realize the wisdom early, and some people realize it late. But alter the nature of the religion and you have nothing to give to your kids, right? So this is the wisdom that when you put pressure on a religious people, okay, then you decrease their numbers, that's not a problem. That means we can coordinate even better with smaller numbers. But you make them stronger and you make them pure, okay, when you put pressure. Now, remove pressure from them, they'll grow by themselves, right? Now you remove pressure from the Muslims, for, or from any religious people, people who have a desire, they're going to grow. So now, as soon as a people are on their deen, you as the enemy, 
the enemy party is stuck. If they put pressure on them, they're going to benefit. If I let them go, they're going to spread. So what is the, really the only, the only tactic way to destroy a religious people, a believing people? There's only one way, and it's not totally in the control of the enemy. The only way to destroy a people who believe in a religion is to present them with an attractive alternative and only hope that their hearts turn away from their God and their prophet to the love of this alternative. This is the only way. The only way a believer can be destroyed is he destroys himself by not loving God and his messenger anymore. That his qibla is no longer Allah and his messenger. His heart is no longer attracted, attracted to Allah and his messenger. His heart is attracted to something else. Rewind about four or five hundred years and you realize this is what happened to the Muslim Ummah. Right? This is what happened to the Muslim Ummah. What was the headquarters of the Ummah? Istanbul. That was the headquarters. Right? Everything was coming from there. And culturally and knowledge wise, Cairo. Istanbul was close to Cairo. Right? And Istan Cairo was close to Istanbul. Istanbul was close to Europe. So who's the new kid on the block 500, four, 500 years ago? It was Europe. They're the new kids on the block. All of a sudden, they're traveling around the world. All of a sudden, they're going to different places, bringing back stuff. All of a sudden, they're making stuff. They're working. They're building castles. They're building new European outfits. The Europeans are moving, right? What did the Muslims do? They started looking at the Europeans. Go into the art history. Art history. Art is an excellent way to study how people are thinking, right? You go into Islamic art and architecture, it has a distinct vibe to it. Very distinct vibe. You start hitting around 400 years ago, around 1500, 1600s of the Common Era, which is around 1000 plus of the uh, Hijri Era, right? You start noticing tulips everywhere. A craze of tulips. Tulips don't grow in any Muslim countries. Tulips only grow in France, right? At the time, tulips only grow in France. You start seeing tulips everywhere, right? You start seeing that the flowers that the Ottomans would make, all of a sudden, it's a tulip, right? Which is very different flower than the Ottoman flower. You look at the, any Ottoman mihrab. Like you go to ISCJ, look at the mihrab. They have a very distinct type of flower that grew in their land, right? Very clear type of flower. The tulip is a closed flower. Around 1500, you start seeing tulips everywhere. You start looking, the eating, ways of eating of the Ottomans started to change. What do you start seeing? Forks, knives, plates, everyone's got their own plate. Tables start to go up, start sitting on chairs, the Sultan, look at the outfits of the Sultans. You can see these, they have portraits. The outfits of the Sultan, all of a sudden his turban's getting smaller. Then no turban at all. His beard's getting smaller, right? His pants, the Turkish pants, start getting skinnier. Until all of a sudden, the Ottoman Sultan, he's a European with the Fez cap. That's it, that's it. Eventually no beard, even. A mustache, right? So from the clothes, from the art, you start to tell and see when people's hearts shift. Right? Why is art and clothes very important, right? It just indicates what you love. It doesn't indicate what I believe, right? Right? It doesn't necessarily indicate what I believe. It indicates what I love. And love is the informant of beliefs. And beliefs are the informants of the laws. Right? And laws indicate where we're going to go in the future. Love is more important than beliefs. Why? You could be totally ignorant, but if you love the Prophet, your future is going to be good. Because you're going to learn. In the future, you're going to learn in the future. Right? Someone who loves Allah and His Messenger, whose heart is in the right place, you shouldn't worry about that person. Sooner or later, he'll learn. Sooner or later, Allah will guide them to learn. But, you start loving dunya. You start loving other cultures. The Muslims 
have never loved a culture except Western culture. They never loved Indian culture. They never loved African culture. They never loved Turkish culture. They never loved Persian culture. They tolerated them, right? And they allowed, you can keep doing whatever, but the Arabs, whenever the Muslims went somewhere, they went as themselves. And you saw those people start putting on turbans, start emulating the Arabs and the Muslims, right? And developing a unique culture that was driven by the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There's only one civilization which the Muslims got weak need and fell in love with that civilization and started hating themselves and, and turned their back on the Prophet ﷺ, and that is Europe and Western culture. Yep. You know the phrase like uh, the, the last straw that broke the camel's back, right? Ataturk was really the last straw, right? A man like Ataturk canceled the Arabic language, stopped the events, prohibited beards, prohibited turbans, prohibited hijab. This is Kamal Ataturk. Shut down all the schools, Islamic schools. Mazar says that, produce imams and ended the caliphate. Such a man could not exist if the rest of the people allowed it to exist, right? So the love of European culture had come in as a disease way before this, right? So there was something called the Tanzimat. Tanzimat came way before Ataturk, in which the elites of Istanbul openly declared that we want to Europeanize Right, our land. So they stopped, made a number of Islamic rules, they canceled them, and they took European rules and law, systems of governance, and started to apply them. And this is way after it had entered the hearts of people. The heart is the most important thing. The direct, what you are loving is the most important thing. And we have a science where you could actually make your heart love something, right? Someone can make his heart turn to Allah and His Messenger by reading stories of the Prophets, reading the Qur'an with thought, right? With deep reflection, making much dhikr, and moving your body. Like we know what our body should do. Our body should be in the masjid. Our body should pray on time. Our tongue should recite Qur'an. And the heart is not in your control, but the body is in your control. You keep using your body in the right way, what happens? Allah says, you have proven yourself, I'll take over, and fills your heart with enough love to carry you. And now, the worship becomes easy. You want to do it. You want to study fiqh. You want to do all these things. That in the past, you could imagine yourself doing it. Because your heart's not in it. Your heart was loving something else. Right? This is how the science of engineering your own heart, right? To move it. If your heart is stuck loving something else. Right? So, once the Muslims started to love European culture as the only civilization that the Muslim ummah at large became weak need and fell in love with and turned its back on the Prophet Every other culture they had no problem with, but they didn't love it more than they loved the Sunnah. So they influenced those cultures, right? So this is the result of what happens, right? The only way to destroy a religion is to present something more attractive, something attractive, and hope that they turn their hearts to it. And this is what happened to the Muslims. Otherwise, if a believing people stay steadfast upon what they believe, then they will see victory sooner or later. Right? And this is what we see happening here. Once Omar came, they realized we can't fight these people head on. So what do we do? We make being Muslim unattractive. So the first unintended consequence that they had, number one, a number of unintended consequences of this ban, is that it forced all the Muslims to live in one area. Right? All of them moved to one area. Okay? They all moved to the area of Bani Hashim. 
So now you have a prophet, a man claiming that he's a prophet. You made a ban on the people, okay, on the Beni Hashem, which forced them all to huddle together their resources. If, if you have a half a gallon of milk and I have uh, half a, bo a box of oats and you have two bananas, the only way to reasonably survive is to pull all our food together. So by doing this ban, all of the Muslims move to one area. So what are they doing every day? They're living with the Prophet. Well, I don't have a job because no one will give me a job. I can't get married. So what do I do all day? I'm sitting with the Prophet. So it was a very bad consequence for them. They only got stronger. You're seeing the Prophet every day, all day, and doing nothing else. So that's the first unintended consequence of the ban. The second unintended consequence is that what is one of the things that weaken people? Excess and luxury weakens people, right? You want to weaken someone? Feed them five times a day. Give them the most luxurious dinner. Let them sleep in every day. He's going to be weak. You want to strengthen someone? Tell him. You want to eat? Go work. Wake up early and go to work. You're going to find after five years, you got a guy. He's sturdy. He's learned a lot of skills. His body's strong. He doesn't have an ounce of fat on his body. Because you, you made him hungry. You made him work. This hunger and this boycott forced everyone to become stronger. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says, We were so hungry in the time of the ban, which lasted about a year or, or so, I don't know what he says here. I think it lasted uh, uh, maybe less than two years, year, one to two years. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said, we will be so hungry that one morning I woke up, came out of my door, I stepped on something, and I realized it's soft and edible. So I shut my eyes, picked it up, threw it in my mouth, and swallowed it right away. Just so I could have something in my stomach. It was probably like a sludge or something. That's how hungry they were. They survived on leaves, all right? And they would take leaves, divide up the leaves, and eat the leaves, okay? So they became sturdy and strong. Who would you rather fight against? A guy who is starving, right, and hungry? Or a guy who just had a steak and he's sleepy on his couch. I'll take the guy who's just had a steak. That guy doesn't know how to fight. That guy is weak. He has no desire, right? Everything he wants, he gets. Weakness. How does Allah strengthen our iman? Ramadan. Go hungry. You become stronger when you go hungry. So they became stronger. Unintended consequence number two. Unintended consequence number three. Sympathy. The oppressed always get sympathy. Human beings are human. P people are people, right? In any time and place, human beings sympathize with the oppressed, right? They sympathize with the oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you ever have a situation where you could be the oppressor or you could be the oppressed, be the oppressed, right? You gain sympathy from people. So now what happened? All of a sudden, all right, all of a sudden, People now, who never paid attention to the Muslims before, they're thinking, what did these people do to go hungry like this, right? They pass by the Muslims and they see them like rolling around on the ground, not able to get up because he's so hungry. They think, what did he do? Did he kill anyone? Did he steal? Just because he doesn't want to worship your God? Just because he's of his religion? All of a sudden, people came out of the woodworks to sympathize with the Muslims. And how did they find loopholes in the ban? Well, who was the ban against? The Beni Hashim. All right? So you're a man from Beni Hashim. But your wife is from another clan. Right? Your wife now, her family's looking on. Well, what did our daughter do to get this? To go hungry. Right? So what did they start doing? Sending her food. Right? I, my, I'm not... He, these people are saying, we're not Muslim, but our daughter has no reason to go hungry, right? So they would pack up camels, 
and hit the camel until it would run into the area where the Beni Hashim live, then any Muslim would catch the camel and they would divide the food. Then they would say, hey, you broke the ban. I didn't break the ban. I'm feeding my daughter. She's not from Beni Hashim, right? And it's not my problem that she's going to share food with her husband and her kids. So the ban actually didn't even fully work in that respect. You couldn't starve him to death because every Muslim, Beni Hashim, Muslim Beni Hashim, he's connected to a woman Right? Who's not from Bani Hashim? So intermarriages, right? Cause in Islam, intermarriage is encouraged in Islam because it makes the Muslims impossible to pin down. If you want to pin, if you're a white nationalist group, you want to pin down the Muslims. The Muslims are not black and brown, right? The Muslims have their whites as well. In France, they have a big problem. Because they, in France, they want to pin the Muslims to be the North Africans. Algerians, Senegalese, right? It's said that if you go into any street in Paris, or any street in France, if you yell, Mamadou, three people will turn around, right? Mamadou is the Senegalese of Muhammad, Muhammadou, right? Three people, three guys will turn around. That's how many Muslims there are in France. But they have a problem. Now white people becoming Muslim. So where do they put them, right? How do you categorize that type of person? And this is the power of a faith that doesn't have geographical or tribal or racial boundaries. So how do you pin it down, right? You want to fight Pakistanis, right? You want to fight Egyptians and Arabs? Fine, you're going to win that fight. American government, you want to fight them? You're going to win that fight. Well, guess what? 40% of the Muslims in America are African American. You're not winning that fight. That fight is done. You're not uh, fighting African Americans. It's over, right? You're not going to defeat them. They're 40% of the, of the Ummah in America, right? People don't know it because they tend to, when a Muslim, when they want to depict a Muslim, they'll find a Pakistani doctor or an Arab uh, engineer. They don't realize Latino communities filled with Muslims too. So it's going to be very hard to pin them down. Increasingly now, you have whites become a Muslim, right? It's going to be hard to pin them down. So this why this ban made the Quraysh look bad. So when you're getting oppressed, don't ever imagine that people aren't watching. Just because they're not helping you, doesn't mean they're not watching and their heart is turning to you and away from your oppressor, right? You can see, obviously, the more that the White House attacks Muslims, the more all sorts of people sympathize, right? So that's an unintended consequence, number three. As a result, the people started thinking. Number one, it's not working. Number two, we don't feel right about it. And number three, people are, we're making, we're starting to look bad, right? We look bad doing this. So one man came one from the pagans, he came and he said, look, I'm fed up with this, right? But what are we going to do? So another man said, hey, look, if you be the first one, I'll be the second one. I don't want to be the first one, right? The, no one could stand up to Abu Jahl by himself. But if you stand up to Abu Jahl, I'll be, I'll be a number two, right? He said, okay. Or, or he said, uh, no one wants to be number one. I'll be, num I'll be the first guy to talk about it if you be my number two. So the number two goes said, I'll be your number two, but I need a number three. So they went and they got themselves a number three. Number three said, I'll be number three, but I need a number four. Right? No one wants to be themselves. Until they got to the fifth guy, he said, all right, that's it. Five is enough. So they went and they have something called Darun Nedwa, which means like their place of assembly. And they're sitting there talking and someone strikes up the conversation. And the number one says, look, honestly, I'm fed up with this ban. It's making us look bad. And what did they really do to deserve this, to go hungry and die? And on top of that, it's not even working because people find loopholes and get food to their daughters, right? So as before Abu Jahl can talk, number two said, yeah, I agree. And as soon as Abu Jahl spoke up, number three said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm with it too. I think we should annul it. Before Abu Jahl could say anything, number four spoke up. And number five spoke Finally, Abu Jahl said, this is planned. You all planned this, right? And before he do that, a sixth man got up, said, I'm going to get the, the disagreement that they had written up. 
He went into the Kaaba, pulled the agreement out. Before he came back, he was saying, he was shouting because the whole agreement had been eaten up by worms except for the first phrase, which was their version of the best They used to say, Bismik Allahumma, that was not eaten up. Everything else of the agreement was eaten up by bugs because it was parchment, parchment back in the day. I mean, that thing doesn't even last a year, piece of parchment, right? So the bugs had eaten up except that port, and they said, that was it, that's a sign right there. So basically, they announced that the ban is annulled. Okay, so right after Omar, war, the head-on war is over, right? Now what's next? The war of attrition. Make their lives miserable, harass them, ban them, etc. Now that's over. So now they have a big problem. What next? All right? And Quraysh, they got something what they would think is a blessing in disguise. Because right now the annulment is over. We're too powerful to fight head on. You just lost the war of attrition. It looked now that the Muslims were going to turn a corner and really co start rallying the bulk of the Meccans around them. But Allah had another plan. It wasn't time yet. That right after the annulment, Abu Talib died and Khadija passed away. When Khadija passed away, the Prophet became busy with his own affairs. He has four daughters, Ali, Zaid, they all live with him, Baraka, all these dependents that the Prophet ﷺ had to tend to, right? He no longer had his assistant. His number one was Khadija, right? His number two was Abu Bakr. His number three was Hamza. Uh, his number three was Ali, right? Then Hamza, then Omar. Now he lost Khadija. So the, shortly thereafter, Abu Talib passed away. Abu Talib, uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is difference of opinion on whether or not he entered Islam or not. But for sure, there were not two witnesses to his shahada. That's for certain. Prophet also said about Abu Talib that he is the least punishment on Yom Al-Qiyamah uh, in the afterlife. But some differed. Is, he's, is he being punished as a kafir or as a mu'min mu who refused to say the shahada openly? Because if he's his latter, then it's a small punishment, then he goes to Jannah. But if it's the former, then it's eternal punishment. And Allah knows best. Uh, but what we know, Abu Talib is the foster father of the Prophet Abu Talib is a good friend to the Prophet. The Prophet took Ali, right? In. Abu Talib was the protector of the Prophet, peace be upon him. No one could touch the Prophet during the time of Abu Talib. Now, the Muslims are strong. The attack to cut their supply lines failed. And they're just about to burst out onto Mecca and win over the bulk of the city when Abu Talib passed away. As soon as Abu Talib passed away, now, any semblance of rule of law and honor of relationship between Abu Talib and the Prophet ﷺ was gone and it was open season on the Prophet himself. He had no protection. Because who became the chief now? Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab became the chief of Quraysh. When he became the chief of Quraysh, at that point, he gave the signal to everyone, attack Muhammad himself. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so now, the semblance of protection that existed no longer existed. Right? So, imagine like in America today, there's still rule of law. Right? There's still civility. We haven't turned the corner. The most they could do to Muslims is harass them, bother them, stop you at the border, ban your, your grandma from coming in, ban you from going out, stop you at the airport. Uh, curse you in the supermarket this is little harassment but we still have our masajid there's still rule of law right you can't go beat up a Muslim and get away with it right we haven't turned the corner but it could well happen something like this where the society turns a corner where rule of law has fallen apart if a judge rules something it means nothing right and you have thugs going around freely this is what happened to the Muslims once they reach that critical mass of numbers, right, that 
death of Abu Talib caused that now there's no rule of law. Anyone, anything's open season on the Prophet ﷺ. It's all open season. The Prophet was praying. They took the recently slaughtered guts of an animal and poured it on his head with the blood and the guts while he's making sajda. They came on the Prophet ﷺ and would curse him openly to his face. Right? Direct abuse. And right at that point, they realized we're not going to get Mecca. They were in position. They were in position that Mecca, the Quraysh, could not do anything anymore. But the death of Abu Talib and the rise of Abu Lahab and the abandonment of any of the old tribal rules. Abu Lahab abandoned all the tribal rules. Right? That you could not, he said, no, this is my nephew, go attack him. Right? That wasn't the tribal rules. Tribal rules, you couldn't do that. Right? Even if he's a kafir and he's a Muslim, right? you couldn't attack your own tribe. You couldn't let someone attack your own tribe. All that's gone. So now, the concept, the idea of bringing the majority of Mecca into Islam is over. And what they have to do now is make the hijrah. And this is what's going to happen next. Very shortly after the two, the uh, what they call the year of sadness, Am al Huzn, right? The Muslims have to make hijrah because now Abu Abu Lahab has broken all the rules, and anyone who wants to uh, attack the Prophet directly has the green light to do so with no uh, consequences. So uh, that, inshallah, will pick up on the hijrah and how the hijrah starts next week but that's basically the summary of how you get to from being weak and in hiding and going to east africa for migration then omar comes then uh war of attrition and they they succeeded through that right up to the last thing but abu talib passed away now there's no rule of law and abu lahab is allowing everyone to attack the Sahara muslims as they please so now they have to start going out and find a new home Right, so, any comments or questions? Mm-hmm. Your cousin? Yeah, what, what happened to you? Here's the thing. It's a very tricky situation. There comes a point when da'wah, inviting people, is actually has a negative consequence. So it's like a cat. Prophet ﷺ said, how do you call people? If your animal ran away, what would you do? They said, we'd run after it. Right? He said, this is why there, no one comes becomes guided at your hands. What I do is I take what they like, I shake the bag of barley and it comes. At least if it doesn't come, it won't go further. Right? So what you what a person should do, if someone is not responsive to a call, then at least find another thing common ground between you and them and establish that bond. And then they'll once they come to that slowly, their heart may turn. But if their heart is not in it and they're not responding to th- one call, second call, third call, then you leave it. Because at that point, we may be without intention making them scared to come because I don't even want to see this person because they're going to call me and, and ask me to do something I don't want to do. 
or I'm not ready to do. So we just leave them to, uh, for their heart to change by itself. And it could happen whenever Allah wills it to happen. But in the meantime, you establish a different bond. Like, no one has a problem eating, right? So what did the Prophet said him say? If no one's answering your call to the deen, right? They will answer your call to food, right? <laughs> so bring some food and they'll come, right? And no talking about anything else. Just eating and chit-chatting. That's it. No discussions. No sandwich on this side, Bible on the other hand, right? Just leave them. Just let them eat and enjoy your company. Because we have another belief. We believe that if there's nur, light in the heart of a person, right, it spreads to other, it hit, reflects on other people. They will feel that ease and comfort in the presence of a mu'min, and that may slowly have an effect upon them. So that's why um, if someone's not answering the call to the masjid or to the deen in general, then you establish another bond and let them come when they're ready. What else we got? Anyone? All right, so we could stop it here. Inshallah, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihat wa tawasub al-haq wa tawasub al-sabr wa s-salam.